Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Graham Hamill, and I'm Vice Provost for Academic Affairs and Dean of the Graduate School. Welcome to UB's eighth annual three-minute thesis competition, a campus-wide competition that challenges our advanced doctoral students to present a compelling and concise overview of their research to a panel of non-specialists in three minutes or less. The three-minute thesis competition was founded at the University of Queensland in Australia in 2008. Um, this competition is now globally recognized and held in over 900 universities in over 85 countries. As a world-class research university, the University at Buff Buffalo is dedicated to fostering innovation and advancing knowledge in all fields. And doctoral education is central to that mission. Our doctoral graduates significantly impact the region, the state, and the nation's um, economy and culture. Our UB alumni are leaders and innovators in, academic, uh, in academics, business, and industry, making a difference in fields ranging from the sciences to arts and culture. And this competition aligns perfectly with our university of mission encouraging our graduate students to think creatively and communicate effectively about their research. The competition is not just an opportunity for our graduate students to showcase their work, which it obviously is, but it's also a chance for us to celebrate their achievements. So to all the finalists, congratulations on reaching this point in the competition. It is, it's an impressive achievement and a testament to your hard work and your dedication. And to that end, um, just to let everyone here know, preparation for the three-minute thesis competition here at UB began in the fall with a preliminary round. This initial round brought fierce competition, leading to our 10 finalists today. After being selected, our finalists went through various workshops and training to help them hone their abilities, including a digital portrait workshop. The digital portraits are on the 3MT website and along the hallway outside this room. And if you didn't get a chance to see them when you came in, take a look when you leave. They're really um, remarkable. Um, they give a beautiful representation of the finalists and the research presented today. Thanks to the CoLab, UB School of Management, and University Communications for supporting these various workshops. Today's event is co-hosted co by the Graduate School and the Startup and Innovation Collaboratory, the CoLab. Thanks to the CoLab for funding the prizes this year. And thanks to all the staff who worked to host this event. And thank you to our campus partners for your work in promoting this event through our university-wide campaign. And I especially want to commend all the graduate students who have participated in all the rounds from start to where we are today. There's been a remarkably positive response to this event from students and faculty who recognize the importance of doctoral education to the university's research mission. And I'm honored to welcome our esteemed panel of judges from the community. Thank you very much for taking the time to participate in today's competition. I also want to welcome um, our audience from um, campus to all over the globe who are watching today on our live stream. A QR code on the screen, it'll show up on the screen at some point, will take you to the 3MT, there it is, to the 3MT website. You can find the bios of our MC um, our judges and today's contestants. Now I know everybody's eager for the competition to begin, so now I'd like to introduce our celebrity guest master of ceremonies, Jordan Walbesser, a UB double alum and director of legal and business affairs at Mattel Inc. Jordan will introduce the judges and the participants in today's competition. Right. Hello, everybody. Uh, I am Jordan Walbesser. Uh, I am apparently a celebrity, which is fantastic. I'm going to add that to my resume after today. Uh, I am honored and really pleased to be here. The Three Minute Thesis is one of my favorite events at UB every single year, and partly because it does one of the things that I think is most important in academics and also uh, the, the real world, the business world, and that is translation. Uh, what everyone is going to do today, all of our contestants are going to do today, is translate something that they have spent uh, hundreds, thousands of hours on researching and really understanding to the deepest detail, translating that into something that someone like me can understand in less than three minutes. And uh, not only is that incredibly difficult, 
uh, maybe because of me, but because of the, uh, you know, the information and the, the technology and the research that's gone into it. But it's also incredibly difficult because three minutes, of course, is a very short period of time. So uh, I'm really excited to see what our uh, finalists, our contestants bring today. I think you'll all be very impressed and I think you will all leave here uh, learning a whole lot of things about some of the great research that has been happening here at the University of Buffalo. So uh, without any further ado, let me explain a little bit about how today is going to work. Uh, I am pleased to welcome you uh, again to the UB's eighth annual three-minute thesis competition. The PhD students presenting their research today are going to be judged on three things. First, their communication style. Was the research that they've done communicated in a language that's appropriate to a non-specialist audience? And was the one static slide, they only get one, allowed during the presentation clear? Was it helpful and does it enhance that presentation? Secondly, be judged on comprehension. Did they make you, the audience, understand the research they've done? Lastly, the presenters are going to be judged on how engaging they were. Uh, did they leave you wanting to know more? Did they leave you with some interesting questions and some thoughts that you're going to share with your friends and family in the days, weeks, and years to come? We're also honored today to have an esteemed panel of judges whose evaluations are going to determine our first, second, and third place winners. Our panel of judges comprises community leaders from various industries, including technology, entertainment, travel, and law. Our judges are experienced professionals who have mastered communicating their work to broad audiences and therefore recognize this development of a critical skill in graduate students and the potential global impact of doctoral research being done right here in Western New York. So please help me give a warm welcome to the judges in no particular order. First, uh, Philip Schneider, Senior Director of Research and Development at ACV Auctions. <laughs> Next, Mercedes Wilson, CEO of Sadie's Foods and TV host at WKBW Channel 7. <laughs> Brad Hahn, Executive Director at Explore Buffalo. And Danielle Shane Brown, Principal of Bellwether Advisors, LLC, and Shane Brown Komen, PLLC. <laughs> but wait, there's more. Ladies and gentlemen, please remember that everyone watching in person and over our live stream today is also a judge. So a round of applause to you, too. Your votes, and I'll explain how to do this after all the presentations, but your votes are going to determine the People's Choice Award winner. So take notes, pay attention, start thinking about who you want to win that People's Choice Award. Okay, that's enough talking from me. Let's get on to the competition. Our finalists today represent the absolute finest at UB. I'm going to introduce each finalist to you, and as I'm doing so, uh, they will come up on stage and prepare to present. I will finish my introduction. Uh, we'll have a little back and forth. We'll make sure your mic's working, allow you to take a deep breath before you get started. Uh, and I'm going to start the clock with our call, ready, set, pitch. Uh, you can take a moment to center yourself. The clock is going to begin when you start speaking your first word. Your slide will appear on the screen, and that timer goes. All right. There's monitors on the center stage uh, displaying the timer both to you, the presenter, and to you, the audience, and the judges as well. Okay. Everyone understand? Good. I see some nods. I know you're nodding at home. That is absolutely fantastic. So um, let's begin uh, starting uh, first. Always a tough one to do, but first is going to be Sabrina Orsi. Come on down. Uh, Sabrina's 3MT presentation title is Fighting Cancer One Snack at a Time, Integrating Science, Nutrition, and Cancer Care. Sabrina is uh, a part of the academic group Pharmacy and Toxicology uh, in the Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences. You hail from Stafford. Uh, that's in New York? 
Virginia. Virginia, Stafford, Virginia, where it's probably slightly warmer than it is here. Um, and I have it here that you like to bake cookies. What's your favorite type of cookie that you like to bake? Uh, sugar cookies. Sugar, uh, yeah. one of my favorites, very good. Well, okay, um, it sounds like we're all ready. Are you ready on your end? I think I'm ready. Okay, um, we're gonna do ready, set, pitch. Take a deep breath and then you can get going. So, ready, set, pitch. As the most feared illness in America, no one ever wants to hear those three scary words, you have cancer. But with two million new cancer cases in 2023, just in the United States, I'm sure everyone in this room knows someone who has heard those words. Personally, I have lost many family members to cancer, but losing my grandma Holly hit me the hardest. Witnessing firsthand how her long battle with cancer affected her and our family, I was left wondering why the currently available therapies weren't good enough and why we couldn't do any better for patients like her. Even though this was almost 10 years ago, cancer is still a major public health issue that has severe social, financial, and psychological consequences. And that's why researchers like me are working hard to make discoveries that improve our ability to treat patients. Now, in order to find these new and improved therapies, it's important to understand how a regular cell becomes cancerous in the first place. So let's pretend our cells are like cars. There are lots of different roads you can drive on to reach the same destination, which in this case is a cancer cell. In the cancer I study, the cells are known to take the road for increased metabolism, which makes it a great therapeutic target or road to put that stop sign on. So what is metabolism exactly? Just like how cars need gas to drive, our cells are fueled by nutrients broken down from what we eat and turned into energy by metabolism. Naturally, cancer cells are rapidly growing and dividing and spreading, so they need a lot more of this energy than regular cells do. And this is the weakness that I am targeting in my thesis. Because what you eat directly feeds into these energy producing processes, in my thesis, I'm using dietary restrictions like fasting to deprive cancer cells of that necessary fuel to slow them down. Now, of course, we can't cure cancer just by cutting some calories, but when combined with traditional anti-cancer drugs, we are able to take treatment one step further so that instead of just slowing that car down, now we're stopping it. Unfortunately, not all tumors are alike, and much like how some cars use get regular gas and others use diesel, different tumors have different energy needs. And this is why my ongoing work involves figuring out exactly how cancer cell metabolism is changed by these different diets so that we can piece together which specific diet and drug combinations are most effective for different subtypes of cancer. For everyone out there like me who has or had a loved one with cancer, you know how important it is to find treatments like this one that are safe, affordable, and effective. By providing the scientific evidence for why and how dietary restrictions work with traditional therapy, my research is improving the future of cancer care one snack at a time. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Sabrina. So now you've got a hang of it. You understand what you're in for. Uh, there's going to be so many great presentations. This one is, uh, is fantastic and of course close to many of our hearts. Uh, one of the great things about the university here is how the research that our students do applies to uh, the real lives of many, not just here in Western New York, but around the world. Um, okay, so. Uh, next up, we have Abipsa Chakraborty. Uh, Abipsa is in the English department and uh, is going to be telling us about Read It With The Ears, listening to the 20th century Anglophone novel. So I'm sure like all of you have uh, listened to books on tape or maybe at least a podcast. Maybe you'll hear something interesting in this pitch as well. Uh, I have here, I always like to highlight the fact that our students are not just 100% academic all day, day in, day out, uh, but they're real people too. So I have a note here that you have over 200 plants in your apartment. Um, I have been able to only keep three plants alive in my life, and two of them are plastic. So one, good for you. Is, do you have a favorite plant or, or one that really just brightens your day in your I, apartment? I love them all, but I love my peace lily plant a lot. Peace lily plant, okay. Is that something that someone like I can, can take care of without it wilting? Absolutely, yeah. Oh, 
<laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll trade ch uh, tips after. But uh, all right, Abipsa, um, if you're ready, ready, set, pitch. Let's take a moment and read the text here. Think about what you hear. And the gramophone began, A, B, C, A, B, C. Now let me ask you a question. What sense organs do we use when we read a novel? Our common sense says that we read with our eyes, right? But what if I told you our ears are equally at work when we're reading a text? This is the premise that inspired my research. My dissertation examines novels written in English in the early 20th century based on the influences of the sound technology of the time. In my research so far, I have found in over 30 novels written across three countries, England, Ireland, and India, that sound technologies such as the gramophone, the phonograph, telephone, and the radio profoundly impacted upon these writings. More specifically, the choice of content and the techniques used in these novels made the writing especially heavy and dense with a strong auditory component. It's almost as though the words on the page summon you as a reader to listen to their melody, their music, the silence, and the echoes. And this is not all. My research also shows that the sound component in these novels was actively used by these authors to fight back against the government and social evils. So the goal of my research is to prove that we read as much with our ears as with our eyes. But why is this important? In today's day and age of chronic attention deficit, more and more people, and I see a lot of my students too, are taking to audiobooks and podcasts instead of reading books. Now, while there is a strong opinion in the academic community that listening to audiobooks offers an experience of lesser value than reading books, I am here to show through my research that novels have always invited the ears of the reader as much as their eyes to take in the full experience of the book. Therefore, the debate about the value and the serious experience offered by audiobooks needs to be urgently reconsidered. The question I will leave you with today is the next time you pick up a book, will you hear it or read it? Thank you. All right. Thank you, Abipsa. That was excellent. Um, there, now you don't have to feel guilty the next time you pull up an audiobook instead of opening the old paper book itself. So, very good. Um, all right. Next up is Mandula Kamdi Vijayahena, who is going to be talking about breaking bad bonds, breaking bad bonds. Will PFAS <laughs> munching microbes save us? No, I'm sorry, this is not a PhD thesis on the TV show. Um, uh, so uh, Mandula Kamdi comes from our chemistry department, and, uh, and not only are you busy studying uh, PFAS chemicals, but I hear you're a bit of a YouTube star. Could you tell us a little bit about what you do on YouTube? Yeah, uh, I have this small channel in the UB, uh, uh, YouTube, uh, where I teach chemistry in my native language, which is Sinhala, to my country people, because, you know, it's, sometimes it's easy to learn it in a funny way, not in a, like, a, you know, how usually lectures teach us. That's, you know? yeah, no, that's good. That's, yeah, I, I, I took, you know, chemistry 107, I think, and I'm not, I could have used some more of the funny way uh, to, to learn chemistry, but... Um, okay, well, we're glad to have you here. We're excited to hear about your, uh, your thesis. So, ready, set, pitch. The bad news is nothing lasts forever. The good news is nothing lasts forever. Has anyone in this audience heard about PFAS? 
They are human-made chemicals which are strongly bound together. Because of their unique water and oil proof properties, they have been used in lots of applications. Basically, they have found everywhere. Have you ever noticed pizza boxes and disposable paper cups, even food packaging, keep their shape even with hot stuff in them? How nonstick pans work fine without oil? Or how raincoats keep us dry? All these contain PFAS. So PFAS can enter our body when we eat, when we drink, even when we breathe. So why do we care? Of course, they can harm our health. So they can cause cancer, increase your cholesterol level, and reduce the vaccine responses, even for COVID vaccines. PFAS also found in breast milk. Imagine mothers passing PFAS into their babies. So part of my research investigates to what extent we are contaminated with PFAS. I do this with blood testing and 95% of all the blood samples I tested contain PFAS. In other words, everyone here in this room might have PFAS in your body. This is very alarming. So the problem with PFAS is they don't break down in the environment or in our body. That's why we call them forever chemicals. But don't worry, I have the solution. We found a bacteria who can destroy these toxic PFAS. In other words, imagine a bustling kitchen, but instead of Gordon Ramsay, I'm the head chef with a new challenge on the menu PFAS. But wait, I'm not alone. I have a team of little chefs, our bacteria buddies, who's ready to roll up their sleeves and chop up these toxic PFAS nearly 100% into smaller pieces. They only need few days. So that means you cannot call them forever chemicals anymore. So my goal is to turn these toxic PFAS into smaller compounds like water. So my discovery holds the key to wiping out these PFAS from the world. So remember, nothing lasts forever. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Mindela. I, uh, I have a plastic water bottle that I've been drinking out of, and, and I think I might just go thirsty instead. So hurry up with your research. Um, no, no, that was very good, very good. Uh, next up, we have Nicole uh, Capazzelio, who is from UB's Social Work PhD program and will be presenting on exploring Eastside residents' visions of nature, a community-based case study. So, um, Nicole, welcome up here. Uh, I, you know, I was looking through your bio, and there were some really interesting things in here, but as we're getting closer to dinner, the one thing that stood out to me was you had a stint at a chocolate factory. Is that right? Six years at a chocolate factory. Six years as a, as a tour guide. A chocolate factory tour guide. Is, yeah. is there, do you know, asking for a friend, is there like a taste tester position that's open? It's, um, it's taken. But it's yeah. taken? Uh, <laughs> next year. Next year. I guess I'll stick with my day job. All right. Um, if you're all set, Nicole, uh, then ready, set, pitch. This is a leaf. To be specific, this is a Norway maple leaf that I picked up on my street on the west side of Buffalo. Every fall, my street is covered in leaves. Leaves that I get to watch change color, flutter to the ground, crunch underfoot, and not rake or bag because I'm a renter. My street is covered in leaves because my neighborhood has some of the highest level of tree canopy of anywhere in the city. And like probably everyone else on my street, I take this for granted. However, bountiful tree cover and surrounding nature is not the norm for every city resident. In fact, according to the nonprofit American Forests, a map of tree cover in America's cities is too often a map of income and race. Perhaps it isn't surprising then that here in Buffalo, the lowest level of tree canopy and the majority of the city's 8,000 vacant lots 
are concentrated on the east side, where 85% of the city's black population lives. This area has higher rates of poverty and unemployment than the city at large, leading Buffalo to be among the most segregated cities in the country. We talk a lot about certain kinds of inequity in Buffalo. Disparities in food access, housing, graduation rates. But what is often ignored is that this inequity extends to the ground beneath our feet and the trees above our heads. So at this point you might be asking, so what? Well, this inequity in nature access isn't without history or consequence. People living in nature-deprived areas have higher levels of depression and heart disease and community level problems, like a lack of neighborhood cohesion. And, more importantly, <coughs> uh, this has impacts on people's bodies, minds, and spirits that we haven't bothered to learn about. In my research, I'm looking at east side residents' experiences of nature, particularly around vacant land. In my work, it was imperative for me to center community members' experiences. I'm doing that using an array of qualitative methods, interviews, a walking tour, and a community visioning workshop. In my work, <clears throat> this work isn't just interesting to me, but it's important. Little research has explored people's experiences in depth. As an Eastside community leader expressed to me, people know they want their neighborhoods to be different, to be better but we don't paint a picture broad enough of what spaces could be. You can't imagine something. How can you build it? With this research, I want to play a small role in envisioning the new. So yes, this is a leaf, but it is also a symbol of beauty, of potential, of justice. All right, thank you very much, Nicole. Thank you. Um, I know I'm looking forward to seeing some of these trees in bloom within the next couple of months. We've had a very, uh, very nice winter uh, <laughs> compared to some other ones that we've had. Uh, next up is going to be uh, Shuchi Ju, who is presenting on personalized cancer vaccine development using something that I can understand already, bubbles. Uh, which is great. Uh, now, Shuchi, I, I understand that, that you have quite a few hobbies, uh, from painting to, to clay to knitting. I think it's fantastic that UB attracts uh, students that are well-rounded and helps encourage those things. But uh, is there any one project that you're particularly proud of or, or that you think is particularly interesting that you've done on the side? All of them. <laughs> all of them. It's like a mother. You know, which one can you love? You have to love them all. Um, well, that's, that's wonderful. Keep doing what you do both at mm -hmm. school and outside of school. Uh, but our, uh, we're here to pitch. So are you all set? I guess. Oh, I, good enough. We'll take it. You don't have a choice. So <laughs> here it comes. Ready, set, pitch. Hello, everyone. Have you ever noticed that while many cancer treatments work effectively for some patients, but they might not work for others? Providing the same therapy to all patients is like providing the one size fit all shoes to everyone. Sometimes it just not fit right, but all of us are unique. We need a more personalized solution. This is where my project comes in, a delivery system to support the personalized cancer vaccine development. Think about all the cells in our body. Cell membranes are made of something called lipid. We use the lipid to form tiny, tiny bubbles called liposomes. Liposomes have been proved to be safe material, even for small animal use. And they are also very good carrier for vaccine antigens and adjuvants, just like a bus. All the antigens are the passenger on the bus, while the adjuvants, they are the GPS, guide the bus, bring passengers to the right place. We're in the right place. How cancer cells survive in patient's body by turning off the immune system. If we can bring the correct passenger to the immune cells, we can turn it on again. We engineered our bus for fast and stable loading of passengers. With the accurate GPS, we can even choose which immune cells we want to turn on. Current technologies can help us to find like hundreds or even thousands of possible passengers but testing and delivering them one by one is time consuming with a very high cost. 
using our bus with the accurate GPS, lots of possible passengers could be delivered at the same time. Even if there is only one passenger can turn on the immune system, our body will start to find and kill cancer cells. Uh, like, so far, we have uh, cured several types of cancer for my study, yes. Like breast cancer, colon, skin, and kidney cancer. And this is only the beginning. We keep upgrading our bus for more accurate delivery, better cancer killing results, and more human-related studies. Just at this moment, we have clinical trials ongoing in South Korea. Just think about how exciting it can be if we are able to provide the cancer vaccine for someone we know. From our lab work to cancer vaccine for human use, it's a very challenging journey. There are only four vaccines approved to prevent cancer and three vaccines to treat ca cancer patients. But nothing can stop researchers from finding the solution for cancer. We are providing a reliable delivery system to support the personalized cancer vaccine development. Some days we will be able to treat cancer like a normal code. I believe, all researchers believe, this day isn't too far away. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Shuchi. Yeah, look, if, uh, if cancer is only uh, a cure is one shot away and only a few years away, sign me up, and I hate shots. So uh, that's fantastic. Uh, next up, we have Greg Congdon. Uh, Greg is in our Civil Structural and Environmental Engineering program here at UB. His presentation title is on Earthquake Rehabilitation, Shake It Till You Save It. So it's a, a nice twist there. Um, you know, Greg, it seems like you've traveled a bit and you're, uh, you're one of nine in, uh, uh, nine children in your family. So middle child. Unfortunately, no, I got top of the pecking order. Top of the pecking order. Yeah. So that means at home or in this audience are the other eight siblings, right? Oh, shame on you. Where if you're watching at home, thank you, Greg, you know, you appreciates it. Um, no, that's wonderful. Uh, I, I love to see that. And I do have to ask about this. You, because uh, I don't know what this is. You are an honorary comes from away of New Finland. I'm a musical guy. I love the musical. What does that mean? So it's actually, um, Newfoundland is like a province of Canada. And I lived there for a year as a part of my work. And so a comes from away is kind of their strange accent for how they refer to people who are there but aren't from there. <laughs> Well, all right, I don't think your presentation's gonna have that Newfie accent uh, today, but uh, maybe that will be after, uh, you know, when we're, we're having some uh, hors d'oeuvres. So, uh, well, with that, Greg, uh, are you ready? Then let's begin. Ready, set, pitch. Recently in California, some historical clay brick buildings were damaged by a moderate earthquake. This is despite the fact that the, earth, that the buildings had been upgraded to resist stronger earthquakes. In general, the buildings did not collapse. However, the damage was just severe enough that falling bricks can pose a pretty significant hazard to people who are in the building or even around the building. In addition, there's also a risk that people could be displaced from their homes because the building is too severely damaged to provide adequate shelter. Given that these historical clay brick buildings are common in most of our cities across the country, this is an issue which needs to be investigated and subsequently addressed. Masonry can come in many different forms. For historical buildings, it's most commonly something called unreinforced clay brick masonry buildings. Now, these buildings tend to look very nice. These are the ones that really catch your eye going down Main Street. Uh, they also tend to last for a very, very long time. However, they can be problematic in earthquake regions. This is because they're both very heavy and very brittle, which is the worst possible combination for surviving an earthquake. As a result, we're not generally allowed to build new unreinforced masonry buildings. However, we're still left with some pretty important issues. The first one, what do we do about the buildings that have already been built? Do we continue strengthening and upgrading them in the same way that we've been doing for the last 50 years? Or, based upon the damage that was recently observed in California, do we need to change and improve our approach to strengthening these buildings? In my research group, 
we took a look at some of the damage which was observed in California and identified what we thought to be some of the key weaknesses in the strengthening strategies that are used by practicing engineers today. In my research, I've taken this a step further and I actually designed and built an unreinforced masonry building on the shaking table in the earthquake research lab here on campus. I designed the building to be as similar as possible to a lot of the buildings that you could find across the country. Then, I designed some simple strengthening measures, which were minimally invasive, based upon approaches that a lot of engineers would actually use if they were looking to improve one of these buildings in the real world today. This included connecting the walls to the roof and to hold the building together kind of like a belt, and also putting some braces against the walls to prevent them from collapsing in or out of the building. I then subjected this building to earthquakes on the shaking table. This enabled us to reproduce some of the damage that was actually observed in real buildings in California and study them in real time in a way that we can truly identify what the actual weaknesses is for our strengthening strategies. I'm confident that my research in shaking masonry buildings will help engineers save them for future generations. Right. Thank you, Greg. Yeah, you know, I look at that, and this is my day job as a toy lawyer. I see Legos when I look at that, which is uh, um, probably, yeah, not a good building uh, material either, Legos. Uh, so, yeah, thank you very much for that. Really cool stuff. If you ever get a chance at UB, by the way, to see the shake table in action, do it. It's really, really cool. Um, okay, so next up is Amea Tandel. Uh, Amea is going to be talking about turning murky to clear, unveiling pure water with membrane magic. Uh, Amea comes from our chemical and biological engineering department. And um, now I'm not gonna hold you to this. We, we, we ask each one of the presenters to give us a list of fun facts, which is really my favorite part. Um, you put a bold claim in here, okay? You said that you can dance while presenting. <laughs> Look at this, talent, you know. Chemistry and dance, who knew? Um, no, we're really excited to hear about your presentation. Are you all set? Yes. I'm okay, set. well then, Amea, ready, set, pitch. Do you know that 1,800 gallons of water used to make one pair of jeans? Yes, you heard it right. Why this is so important? The current human population is almost 8.1 billion. Each and every individual craves for different clothing or food and beverages according to their own taste. In order to cater such huge mass of population, different industries such as textile or manufacturing use different types of colors, also known as dyes, in their processes. According to a recent report, more than 0.4 million tons of dyes are used every year, which contributes to almost 2 billion liters of polluted water. Imagine such huge volume of polluted water if directly sent to the ocean or river without any treatment. It will not only have harmful effect on human health, but also it will have toxic effect on marine animal and plants. According to UNESCO in 2023, more than 1 million of marine animal died due to water pollution. The existing method for water purification, such as distillation, are energy intensive. Hence, they are an attractive option for the investor to put money on. On the other hand, as a membrane and a research scientist, it is my duty to provide economically viable solution for such a huge global problem. In my lab, I have developed a membrane or a filtration system which is inspired from 2010 Nobel Prize winning technology that is graphene-based carbon structure. This membrane can remove this small size of dye molecule from water and this purified water can be directly sent to the water scarce area. According to the US Department of Energy, 90% of the energy consumption can be easily reduced if we can use membrane separation over the current conventional separation processes. Now you must be having one question. What is the difference between household filtration system and the membrane filtration system you have designed in your lab? The household filtration system are designed to remove large contaminants from water. They lack the ability to remove such small dye molecules from water. In my lab, 
we have this system which can purify 6,000 liters of water per year and our future target is to scale up this process where we can reduce pollution 6% each year. Therefore, to protect our environment, to provide a sustainable solution for such a huge global waste water problem and to provide drinkable water to each and every individual who are craving for single drop of water. Membrane is the future and I promise that future is in my lap. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Amea. Um, I am not going to dance. I just stand here and you'll all be happier for that, trust me. Uh, next up, we have Albert Akil, who is presenting on Echoes from the Past. Uh, Albert is from our Biological Sciences Department. And uh, you know, looking at your bio, it seems that you've traveled quite a bit and lived in quite a few cities. Uh, a little bit. I, I, a little bit, a little bit. A little I have bit. to ask, do you have a favorite? Buffalo. Okay, you don't Basketball get extra points for that. <laughs> Judges, no extra points for that. But you're right. <laughs> I am. All right. Albert, are you all set? Yes. Well, then ready, set, pitch. Today, I'll tell you a story. A story of a woman. A story that begins in Southeast Alaska. Now, when we zoom in on this region, we see that it is home to two types of indigenous nations. Ones that live away from the coast, the interior nations, and ones that live right at the coast, the coastal nations, including the Klingit. Now inside the Klingit territory is a cave. And within that cave was found a bone, about this big, presumed to be from a bear. But preliminary analysis revealed that we were in fact looking at a human bone, a bone from a woman who lived 3,000 years ago. We stopped our research. We went to the tribal elders of the Klingit and asked them if it is okay for us to study what is potentially their ancestor. They said yes, but she will no longer be just a subject. She would have a name, and her name would be Tatuk Yikis. Shavat, the young woman in the cave. With this, we got back to work. We extracted DNA from the bone and compared it against the DNA of modern day indigenous people from the same region. The genetic results are shown on the graph. Here, every point is an individual. Blue points are coastal individuals. Red are interior individuals. The closer together two points are on this graph, the more closely related those two individuals are genetically. Here, we see that Tatu Kikis Shavath, the black star, is more closely related to the blue coastal individuals, including the Klingit, than the red interior individuals. Well, the close relationship between the Klingit and Tatu is consistent with Tatuk being an ancestor to the Klingit people. And this is interesting, because this tells us that the Klingit people are living today in almost exactly the same place where their ancestors did 3,000 years ago. This is a remarkable case of genetic continuity over a strip of land no wider than a few hundred miles. This sort of continuity is rare in other parts of the world which makes the story of Tatuk and the Klingit people extraordinary. Now the story that I have told you today highlights how much we can learn about the astounding history of an entire population based on nothing more but a few faint echoes from the past. Thank you. All right, thank you, Albert. Uh, yeah, CSI Buffalo by way of Alaska. So really, really cool stuff. Uh, next up, we have Jack Reeves, who will be presenting Brain on Fire, imaging, or, yeah, imaging smoldering brain inflammation in multiple 
sclerosis. So um, brain on fire is usually what I get at the end of the day, where smoke is coming out of my ears because I've been thinking too much. But I don't think that's what you're going to be talking about. Um, I, I understand that you're a very busy guy and that you've, you've written quite a few papers. And, and oftentimes in academics, there are certain people that you work with uh, all the time uh, or that you start to build relationships with. But I understand that um, you've acknowledged a special someone on, on at least four of your papers. Uh, who's that special someone? Yeah, that special someone is actually my cat, Daisy. So <laughs> Daisy is a very talented cat. And although she's not very good at science, she has really supported me during my PhD journey. So I thought it was appropriate to give her a small acknowledgement on some of my papers for her, her well, help in my research. Well, that's great. Well, here's to Daisy. And um, uh, I, I've got a cat myself. And uh, she usually helps knock things over. So I'm glad that Daisy Perfect. has been more help to you uh, than, than mine to me. So uh, without further ado, are you all set? I'm good to go. OK. Ready, set, pitch. This is Mark Stecker. I have the pleasure of knowing Mark through his work in multiple sclerosis advocacy. Mark's a former director of DVD production at an international music company based in New York City. When he wasn't busy with his job or spending time with his wife, Mark liked taking his dog, Stella, for long walks along the Hudson River. One cold Sunday in March 2003, Mark was walking Stella when he noticed his right leg buckling, causing him to limp. He went to a doctor to get it checked out. Two months and many appointments later, Mark was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Mark's doctors thought a flare-up of brain inflammation may have contributed to his limp. In flare-ups, the immune cells patrolling your blood, the ones that are supposed to protect your body from infections, instead invade and attack your brain. Mark was prescribed a drug designed to prevent flare-ups with the hope that it would also prevent future symptoms. But despite the medication, less than four years after his diagnosis, Mark was forced to retire from his jog due to increasing disability. One year after that, he was wheelchair bound. Now Mark's story is unfortunately not unique. While current multiple sclerosis drugs are very good at minimizing flare-ups, they don't prevent long-term disability. So why is this the case? What is happening in the brains and bodies of people like Mark that caused them to continue getting worse? This question has challenged scientists and doctors for decades, but there has been progress. Scientists currently theorize that a major driving force behind multiple sclerosis disability comes from a different type of brain inflammation called smoldering inflammation. In smoldering inflammation, the, cells, the damage is caused by cells already within the brain rather than external invaders. And as, it, as its name suggests, smoldering inflammation slowly eats away at the brain tissue over many years. If this theory is true, it provides a new target for multiple sclerosis drugs and a new hope for people like Mark. In my research, I detect smoldering inflammation using specialized brain imaging. By using previously collected data, I compare how much smoldering e inflammation each person has to how their disability progresses over time. And so far, the results are promising. I found that just as theorized, people with more smoldering inflammation have greater disability increases over 10 years. And I've also found the appearance of new smoldering inflammation is linked with reducing size of crucial brain areas. Now this can lead to problems down the road in everything from walking to memory. So what's next? Well, I'm currently exploring an important question. Why do some people have a lot of smoldering inflammation while others have very little? Mark's disability is irreversible, but he still dreams of a day where cure for multiple sclerosis has been discovered so future generations don't have to suffer. I hope my work contributes to that cure. All right, thank you, Jack. Okay, um, last but certainly not least, uh, next up is Sagarika Suresh. Uh, Sagarika will be talking about digital healing, transforming AI into allies for online marginalized healthcare populations. Uh, you are from the, uh, the School of Management, Management, Science, and Systems, is that right? Yes. And I understand that, um, that you like to work out, that you're a fitness fanatic, but um, is there any particular sports or anything that you like more than another? 
Um, I would say maybe like badminton. Badminton. Okay. Yeah. Now here, here's something that you might not know about Sagrika. What what hand do you use when you play badminton? Both, actually. <laughs> so, and it's not because she's just that good. You are ambidextrous, right? Yeah. So. Who does all sorts of talents here today, not just pitching and not just PhD research and not just changing the world. Um, so uh, again, last but not least, are you ready? Yes. Okay, well in that case, ready, set, pitch. I'm sure most of us have used a chatbot at least once in our lifetime. Now by show of hands, how many of you here have successfully got your user queries resolved by a chatbot? I don't see many hands up there. Studies have shown that 91% of user queries have almost never been resolved by chatbots. In fact, 99% of users prefer user interactions over chatbot interactions. So why is it that then chatbots are being introduced to spaces that actually require human role, human role intervention, spaces such as healthcare? Companies are making millions of dollars in revenue by selling companion agents to patients with marginalized healthcare populations patients who are facing sexually transmitted diseases as well as mental health issues. During my study, I conducted a simulation where we behaved as mental health patients with these chatbots. We noticed that these chatbots were learning and adapting to user behavior. So if I behaved like a mental health patient who was feeling suicidal, the chatbot would in turn reply back in a suicidal manner with me. The results from these simulation studies were extremely shocking to us. So we went ahead and interviewed two sets of researchers, that is AI experts as well as therapists. The AI experts suggested that the reason why they were building these tools is because there was lack of therapy out there. And even if there was therapy, it was extremely expensive in nature. The AI experts on the other hand suggested that the reason why they were actually uh, the therapist, on the other hand, suggested that the reason why chat, uh, mental health patients reach out, reach out to chatbots is because they feel stigmatized about their situation. The chatbots, in turn, were cutting them off from real human interaction and thereby making them and their situations much more worse. So during my PhD research, we built a clinically validated chatbot that learned from various therapy use cases, specially catering towards marginalized healthcare populations. So we realized that the user interactions with these clinically validated chatbots were much more richer, safer, and contextually much more better. However, the problem is far from being solved. There are still many chatbots out there that are non-clinically validated. So my research further goes on to bring in governance policies, principles, as well as frameworks in such a way that we make these already existing AI systems digitally healed. I believe that AI is, should be available to all, especially marginalized healthcare population. And the only way we can achieve this is through human and AI collaboration. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Sagarika. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think you can see why I love this competition so much. I enjoyed every single one of these presentations, and I hope that you did too. So let's take a second and give a round of applause to all of the students that presented today for their excellent performance. Really, no, thank you. I know this is uh, three minutes up here, but that symbolizes and represents hundreds of thousands of hours worth of work that you have put in. So really, congratulations. Uh, at this time, I invite our judges to step out of the room to deliberate about the performances and the presentations today. Good luck. I am glad that I am not you. Um, no, but also while they're out, a round of applause for our judges, too, again, for their time and attention. And I have more instructions. So all the finalists, again, thank you. Please head out side um, behind the judges. We're going to do a group photo in the hallway. So we'd love to just capture that, memorialize all the hard work. So if you can do that. To everyone else, uh, all of our viewers here, please remain seated. I have some instructions for you because if you remember from 
uh, 30 minutes or so ago, I told you that you too are judges. So let me give you some instructions about how you can vote for today's People's Choice Award. So it's now time for you to vote for the finalists that you feel did the best job communicating their research today. So get out your phone, your tablet, your laptop, your PC, your iPod, whatever you have that can connect to the internet and read a QR code. Uh, and you can go to this website and vote. If you can't get the QR code working, there's that link that you can type in below. Um, please note, it is one vote per person, okay? The uh, website address QR code is there. Voting is now open, all right? So please enter your votes now. And to stay in our theme of the three-minute thesis, we are giving you, the viewers, three minutes to go vote. So I'm going to ask our official time clock keeper to begin. I don't know if that's up there, but if not, you have three minutes. I will not sing the Jeopardy theme song, but just imagine it in your head. And I guess one thing that I will do while we're uh, getting those votes in, and someone will just have to raise their hand when three minutes is up, because I haven't practiced this like everyone else. Uh, I just wanted to take a moment uh, again to thank you for coming out today and, uh, and watching these presentations. What you've seen is really just the tip of the iceberg as far as the world-class research that is being done here at the University at Buffalo. So for every student that you saw present today, there are hundreds more that are doing this kind of groundbreaking research uh, right here every year. So thank you for being involved in the university community. Uh, and thank you for really supporting our students, but also this community as well as we grow and hopefully change the world. Um, lastly, keep your eye out for upcoming events. Uh, there's plenty of things like this on campus at UB uh, related not just to our fantastic academics, uh, but also athletics as well as some upcoming uh, events for entrepreneurship. I'm sure you'll be hearing about some of those if you haven't heard about them already. So, um, I think, uh, judging by, let's see, the looks in the crowd here, I can't see you at home, but I'm assuming you've had some time to get your votes in. If you don't, uh, that three-minute window will be closed soon. Uh, I do have a brief interlude before our award presentation, so something that you get to enjoy both at home and in the room. For your entertainment, while the judging panel is doing their very hard work to deliberate, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Emily Barger, a soprano and master's candidate in vocal performance at UB. Uh, Emily is going to be singing a collection of songs written by the celebrated singer-songwriter Joni Mitchell off her 1971 album, Blue. Each song represents and uh, reflects emotion in a way that gives Emily's research the most authentic forms of human expression through vocal color. So Emily uh, will announce the title of each song before it is performed, and thankfully for all of you, this will not be a duet. So uh, without further ado, uh, Emily, come on up. Thanks for having me, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think, you know, you could consider songs as its own three-minute thesis. So thank you for having me today. I'm here to soothe you all while everyone's deliberating. Um, my first song is California by Joni Mitchell, a fun one. Sitting in a park in Paris, France Reading the news and it sure looks bad They don't give peace a chance That was just a dream that some of us had Still got all our lives to see But I wouldn't want to stay here It's too old and cold and settled in its ways here But California, oh, California Come in home I'm gonna see the folks I dig I'd even kiss a sunset peak California, I'm coming home A 
met a redneck on a Grecian on who did the goat dance very well. He gave me back my smile, but he kept my camera to sell. Oh, the rogue, the red, red rogue. He could put on my lets and stews, and I might on stayed on with him if my heart cried out for you. California, oh, California, I'm coming home. You speak the rocks I dig and keeps the sunset peak. California, I'm coming home. Oh, it gets so lonely when you walk in. And your streets are full of strangers All the news of home you read Just give you the blues Just give you the blues So I bought me a ticket and I caught a plane to Spain Went to a party down a red dirt road. There were lots of pretty people there, reading Rolling Stone, reading Vogue. Said, how long are you gonna hang around? I said, a week, maybe two, just until my skin turns brown. Then I'm going home to California. Oh, California, coming home. I'm gonna see the folks I dig. I'd even kiss the sunset peak. California, I'm coming home. Oh, it gets so lonely when you walk in and your streets are full of strangers. All the news of home you read more about the war and the bloody changes. Oh, will you take me as I am? Will you take me as I am? Will you? Will you take me as I am? Mm -hmm. Ooh. Take me as I am. Oh. Oh. Will you take me as as I am. Thank you. Thank you, fellas. The next one is a little bit more somber. We've been picturing that whole world in the soundscape. This one's called Little Green. <laughs> Choose her a name she'll answer to Call her green and the winters cannot fade her Call her green for the children who've made her little green Be a gypsy dancer to California Here in that everything is warmer there So you write him a letter and say Her eyes are blue He sends you a poem And she's lost to you Little green He's a non-conformer just a little green Like the color when the spring is born There'll be crocuses To bring to school tomorrow Just a little green Like the nights when the northern lights perform 
There'll be icicles and birthday clothes And sometimes there'll be sorrow Child with a child pretending Weary of lies you are sending home so you sign all the papers in the family name. You're sad and you're sorry, but you're not ashamed of little green. Have a happy ending, just a little green. Like the color when the spring is born. There'll be crocuses to bring to school tomorrow just a little green like the nights when the northern lights perform there'll be icicles and birthday clothes and sometimes there'll be songs Thank you. This next one is also a little sad. But um, what I like about it is it centers kind of around Christmas time, and I think you can hear that in the little piano part. So this one's called River. coming on Christmas they're cutting down trees they're putting up reindeer and singing songs of joy and peace I wish I had a river I could skate away on but it don't snow here it it stays pretty green I'm gonna make a lot of money then I'm gonna quit this craze See, no, I wish I had a river I could skate away on. I wish I had a river so long I would teach my feet to fly. Oh, I wish I had a river I could skate away on. tried hard to help me, you know. He put me at ease and he loved me so naughty, made me weak in the knees. Oh, I wish I had a river I could skate away on. I'm so hard to handle. I'm selfish and I'm sad. Now I'm gonna lost the best baby that I Ahead. Oh, I wish I had a river I could skate away on. I wish I had a river so long I would teach my feet to fly. Oh, I wish I had a river skate away on I made my baby say goodbye Thank you. 
It's coming on Christmas. They're cutting down trees. They're putting up reindeer and singing songs of joy and peace. I wish I had a river I could skate away. Thank you. Not so much of a sad one next. Hooray. This one is called My Old Man. He's a walker in the rain. He's a dancer in the dark. We don't need no piece of paper from City Hall. Keeping us tight and true now. My old man, keeping away my lands and blues. Thank you very much. One more for you all, and then you will find out the winners. Oh. This one is called A Case of You. Thank you so much.
Just before love got lost, you said, I am as constant as a northern star. And I said, constantly in the darkness. Where's that at? If you want me, I'll be in the bar. On the back of a cartoon coaster. In the blue TV screen light. I drew a map of Canada. Oh, Canada. With your face sketched on it twice. Oh, you're in my blood like holy wine. You taste so bitter and so sweet. Oh, I could drink a case of you. Darling, and I would still be on my feet. Oh, I would still be on my feet. in a box of paints. I'm frightened by the devil and I'm drawn to those ones that ain't afraid. I remember that time you told me you said love is touching souls. Sure you touch mine cause part of you pours out of me. From time to time Oh, you're in my blood like holy wine You taste so bitter and so sweet Oh, I could drink a case of you Darling, still lap you on my feet Oh, I would still be on my feet She knew your life, she knew your devils and your deeds, and she said, go to him, stay with him if you can, but be prepared to bleed. Oh, but you are in my blood, you're my holy wine, you taste so bitter, bitter and so sweet, oh, I could drink a cake. still be on my feet thank you everybody Congrats to all. All right, thank you so much, Emily. That was fantastic. Uh, at this time, we're going to have our judges come back down. I, that must have been the hardest job of the week for you, so thank you so much. Um, and then at this time, I would like to welcome Graham Hamill, our Vice Provost for Academic Affairs and Dean of the Graduate School, back to the stage to begin the award presentations. Okay, so this is the moment. Um, before I announce um, the, the winners of the competition, I, I wanna congratulate 
um, all the participants, this is really a, an amazing celebration of graduate research and you're all doing really transformative work. So we should give them a round of applause. Um, I'm going to call the name of the third award winner, the second award winner, the first award winner, and finally the People's Choice winner. And when I call your name, please come to the stage to receive your um, very large check, um, literally very large check, um, and remain on stage until um, all the winners are announced. So the third, in third place, Echoes from the Past, Albert Akil. I did say it was a very large check. <laughs> um, second place winner, Amea Tondal, turning murky to clear. Um, and in first place, Breaking Bad Bond, <laughs> Madula Kwame Vidudu And last but not least, certainly, the People's Choice Award, Fighting Cancer One Snack at a Time, Sabrina Orsi. So just one more time, thanks to our judges, our MC, and to um, all of you, our audience, for participating in this event and supporting all of our graduate students. Um, and just to conclude, I would really like to invite judges, MC, participants, everybody here to pick up a UB cookie on the way out. There are also some snacks for your enjoyment. So thank you, and congratulations once again.